Welcome to the Western Vowel Podcast Series, with talks on traditional spiritual teaching and its application in the world today. The intention of the series is to offer something useful for those who are drawn to study themselves and engage practice on the spiritual path. New talks are posted twice each month. The content of the talks is for informational purposes only and not to provide any kind of counseling, medical, or professional advice. This podcast is titled Contemplation, Awareness and Presence in Ordinary Life. The talk was given by Angelon Young on June 30th, 2020, in Prescott, Arizona. Angelon is a workshop leader, editor, and author of As It Is, Under the Punai Tree, The Bowel Tradition, Caught in the Beloved's Petticoats, Enlightened Duality with Lee Lozowick, and Krishna's Heretic Lovers. Angelon Young. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I would like to dedicate this evening's um, gathering to my very dear friend and companion on the path, Karuna Fedorshak. Karuna and um, Vijay together uh, esta- uh, developed and created this Saturday Night Talk series that's been going on for 10 years now. And Karuna, um, Karuna died two weeks ago. And so we're remembering her and celebrating her every day these days. And this is a wonderful opportunity to, to do that, to remember and celebrate her and her life and her tremendous contribution to our lives in a very personal way, because she was a, an inspiration and a Dharma sister, beloved wife, mother, devotee, and um, wayfarer on the path. So thank you, Karuna, for everything that you've given So our, our subject tonight is contemplation in ordinary life and um, the development of, of presence and awareness in everyday life. You know, every spiritual quest leads sooner or later to contemplation. And although it is different than meditation in certain ways. I'm not going to go into that so much tonight. I just want to focus on contemplation. They do have a lot in common, and you'll, you will um, have your own, you'll make your own connections as the talk goes on, goes on in the evening. I'm going to talk for a while and um, present some of my reflections and some of my experience on contemplation, and then I'm going to open it up for us to be in conversation together for you to ask questions or present a consideration or make comments. So the first time I gave this talk on contemplation, I, of course, went to the dictionary, to the English dictionary, and looked it up, and I said, what does the dictionary say about contemplation? The English dictionary that I looked at, which is about this thick. It's huge. I I use it. I actually still use it. I'm kind of a dinosaur in that way. It says to look at thoughtfully, to pay attention to and ponder, to investigate, to dwell upon, to meditate upon, to plunge into. So this is, you know, this is spanning a very wide range of possibility here. The word contemplation comes from a Latin word, contemplare, which means, and I find this actually a little more interesting, contemplare is the space that is created for observing auguries. So an augury is a sign, it's an omen, it's a prophecy, it's um, basically the art of divination, Divination usually refers to some kind of fortune telling or or telling the future, prophesying. But there's another way to look at the art of divination. If we're creating a space for the art of divination, 
When something is divinized, it is made divine. And this is really much closer to the context that, for me, contemplation is in my everyday life, in my ordinary everyday life. So contemplating, contemplation, it's about this innate need that we have to go within and to cultivate the intuitive, creative, and sacred within ourselves, to get to know it. If we are, if we are creating a space, an inner space inside, in which we are going to um, practice the art of divination, We're looking to know that which is unknown. Really, it's not about signs and portents and the future and all that. Really, it's about the unknown. So if we're going to begin to know that which is unknown, we have to begin to unknow that which the thinking mind believes that it knows. So it's a kind of an interesting um, flip there that we have to do. We have to We have to go the opposite direction from what we think we know. Educating ourselves and study. This is a a profound spiritual practice, and it has been for me. It's very important. But at the same time, at some point, we have to jump off into not needing to know. Years ago, I think probably 35 years ago, I ran across this book titled The Cloud of Unknowing. It was written by an anonymous monk sometime, I think, in like maybe the 6th century or 9th century or a long time ago, anyway. And I read the book. It's, It's a fabulous book. But the thing that stayed with me was the title, The Cloud of Unknowing, because it fascinated me back 35 years ago that I... That, that I could begin a process of not knowing, of unknowing. Now, this may not sound like it's a lot of fun, but actually it is. It's about creating space to be free inside ourselves, free from our concepts, from everything that we've been told we should be doing, that we should be. Um, contemplation helps us to develop awareness in the moment. It happens anywhere, anytime. And I, I'm sure that every one of you has a reference point for um, some of your best contemplations happening when you're either washing the dishes or cleaning the house or, or doing something, you know, raking up the leaves or working in a garden, of course. That's a great time for contemplation. But it happens anytime, anywhere, even when we're telling a story to a child. Because really, the contemplative mood, it's an inner state of being. It's not something that we're doing necessarily. We can be doing something and be contemplative in that. And we all, we all know this. We all have a reference point for it. Contemplation is alive and flowing. It's not static. It connects us to flow if we let ourselves go into it. It's expansive. It's unlimited. It takes place inside of us in the inner world. And we could say that it's an act of love. In contemplation, we build our capacity to be a vessel for awareness. Awareness, out of our awareness, we can begin to create intention for our own transformation. We have an intending. We have an intention for transformation. And why are we interested in transformation? We're interested in transformation for the benefit of all beings. Contemplation and awareness lead to clarity and self-knowledge. And so one of the aspects of contemplation, one of the things we get from our contemplation is we get to know ourselves a lot better. I like the Taoist uh, approach here. We're reading all these, you know, all of these different definitions or or uh, potential ways of understanding what contemplation is because it's very mysterious. And the Taoists say, Lao Tzu says, muddy water let stand becomes clear. 
Very simple. So one of the reasons that we want to cultivate a contemplative aspect of ourselves or a contemplative approach to life, in fact, is because it's going to deepen our self-knowledge. And you may say to yourself, I've already done all of that work. I've, I've done psychotherapy. I've been on the path for 40 years or however long we've been on the path. Um, but in fact, self-knowledge is an ongoing process. We are mysteries unto ourselves. We don't even know. And at every turn of the wheel in our lives, when we turn 30, when we turn 40, when we turn 50, 60, I'll be 70 this year. Um, you know, what we knew, what we knew in the past, that was then, this is now. So we're an ongoing work in progress. And the more we know about ourselves, the better it's going, the more workable, the more, uh, the more we can begin to work with ourselves in this process of transformation. It's kind of a, uh, contemplation is a kind of inner questing. It's like we're going within. And if we don't know where to begin, we can begin with some basic questions for ourselves about how I am right now. Not how I was when I was, again, when I was 30, 40, or 50, but how am I right now? Uh, a long time ago, I trained as a psychotherapist in the Jungian model, which many of you who know me, you know this, or you've listened to my talks, you've heard me speak about some of this from that perspective. And one of the things that I learned as a therapist was that when we are asking ourselves questions, we don't ask why, because why is kind of a loaded, oh, it's already loaded, it's already uh, there's already some angst in there. There's already some anxiousness in there. There's already some, a little bit, maybe even a little bit of judgment in there. So we ask where, when, what, in what way, who, and how questions. So I'm I'm going to just offer you some questions that you can sit with during this talk for yourself. And you can ask yourself these questions. Where in my life and when in my life am I bright and illuminated? Where and when in my life am I in flow? I'm flowing. I feel free. Where and when am I spontaneous, natural, true to myself? Where and when in my life do I have clarity? When and where in my life am I aggressive, anxious, feeling lost, stressed out, confused? When and where am I constricted, self-conscious, and miserable? What is it that brings me joy? What is it that brings me sorrow? And am I able to live with and be enriched by both joy and sorrow. So these are just some examples of questions we can ask ourselves as inroads and initial inroads into contemplation. Asking questions, we're not looking for answers. It's not about answers. It's about insight and revelation. It's about freedom. It's about creating some inner space. It's even about radical self-honesty. My teacher, Leigh Lozowick, he said, uh, this is a quote from him, and he said this many times in many different ways. So here's how he said it on this particular occasion. He said, every real teacher shows the student how to suffer in a real way. Real suffering produces alchemical gold. Ordinary suffering is just misery. My friend Lalita, Lalita Thomas, um, she's an ashram up in Canada. 
She's been on the path for many, many years. She coined this phrase, luxury, luxury suffering. There's a lot of that that goes on when we have a life of privilege, as many of us do. Preparing for this talk, I, I uh, have contemplated quite a bit the things that the uh, racial violence that's going on in the United States right now, and including in Arizona. And uh, I've been thinking quite a lot about it, in fact, and praying about it and contemplating it. And um, I was thinking about how when I was a young person, when I was in my 20s, I was very active politically. And I grew up in the Deep South, and so I grew up with the issue with issues of racial injustice. And I can remember being heartbroken as a small child about this issue. But by the time I was in my 20s, of course, I got very radicalized in, in, my, in my late teens um, by the assassinations of Bobby Kennedy and, and, and Martin Luther King. Very radicalized. But by the time I was in my, in my uh, mid and late 20s, my attention was drawn to the struggle of indigenous people in the United States and the tribal people, Native American people. And I was uh, very actively involved in that. And um, it was a powerful experience for me. Heartbreaking, of course. At that time, there were struggles going on all over the United States, but some of the ones that I was the most involved with were, was the um, struggle of the Navajo and Hopi people to try and stop the United States government from mining for uranium at Big Mountain in the northeast corner of Arizona. So I'm bringing this up because I want to voice my solidarity and I want to voice my wish and my prayer for unity and peace and for an end to racial injustice, for an end to division around religion, for an end to all of these things somehow in this world. By the time I was 35, I had, for myself, come to the realization, the insight, that for me, the way I personally could make a difference in the world, in a world that is in desperate need of our love, our presence, our awareness, our conscious attention, our, our prayers for, for peace and for benevolence, the way that I could best make a change was to work here and to enter into to a life of contemplation, of meditation, of prayer. And so I'm still, that's, that's still what I'm doing. In order to do that, we do have to know ourselves. We have to begin to empty out and unload the baggage that we carry with us you know, our, our, um, so many of our activities, kind of um, the activities of mind and emotion that go on for us, just fill up our inner space until we are suffocating with it. There's no room in there. We, can't, we can hardly, we're stuffed full. We can hardly breathe or take in the nourishment that we consume in our lives, all of the different impressions um, because there's nowhere to put it. And so the contemplative life or being willing to cultivate a contemplative aspect of ourselves and bring that into our lives as a way to increase our awareness of the awareness that's natural for us, that's there, that's present all the time, but we're not aware of it. We have to create some space inside to do that. For most of us, we're just filled with our defense mechanisms. And I was thinking about this, you know, this is the metaphor. This is a metaphor. The AK-47s and automatic rifles and, and grenades and machetes of our inner world, you know, that we actually do torture ourselves with a lot of our activities of mind and emotion. So this is why we want to know ourselves in the spiritual journey and what we must know ourselves on the spiritual journey. I want to take just a little short moment to... Um, do a little bit of uh, transpersonal psychology 101 here because um, I think it's helpful to us. I feel every time that I give a talk that I want to say something about 
the importance of realizing that there is continuity between that which we consider to be psychological and our spiritual transformation. There is continuity between what we call the psyche, psychology, psychotherapy. There's continuity between that and spiritual transformation. It's actually in our wounds and in our complexes, the places where we are are, uh, contracted. This is where the most powerful energy is stored. And as we begin to come into conscious relationship with those, we begin to release a tremendous amount of energy that then becomes available to us in our quest and in our path. So it's very important that we not just throw that baby out with the bathwater. The self, I'd like to talk about that for just a moment, what it is in us, the true nature in us, this organizing principle that we often refer to as the self, self self-realization. It is integrative and inclusive, and it moves in a positive direction toward unity. It moves, it has a meaningful intention toward wholeness. It has a direction or a flow or an evolution toward unity and recognizes its universal connection with all the rest of life. So that's where we're going on the spiritual path, on the quest. We're headed toward unity. And that's self or true nature, which we're we're already given, the whole thing, all of it. Enlightenment is really already present for us. We just don't know it. We don't remember it. It's covered over. We've heard the teaching. We know this. But I know for myself, I can't hear it too many times. I need to hear it again and again. This self innately knows and feels and expresses its connectivity, the connection that we share with with everything, flowers, trees, rocks, bumblebees, lions, rattlesnakes. I had to put rattlesnakes in there because I've had a very close encounter with a rattlesnake this week. My husband and I discovered a very large rattlesnake with probably about 12 rattles. The more rattles a rattlesnake has, the older it is. So this was a venerable old rattlesnake, and we kept referring to this snake as she, and I'm not sure why, but we did. So we took it away. Interestingly, we we have a snake stick, and it had just arrived by mail that day, the day that the rattlesnake showed up. Because the rattlesnake chose this place to, to live in our garden where there's water and there's chipmunks and there's squirrels and rabbits and flowers and, you know, a wonderful little spot. Great. It's like the best place around our cottage is the perfect place. And this rattlesnake was so wise and it chose this spot. So Thomas gets the snake stick and very easily gets the snake and takes it away down the road and across the canyon. And we say, okay, God bless the rattlesnake. Blessings on that snake. May her life be long and happy and fruitful. Oh, whew, she's gone. Because where she wanted to live was right next to our patio where we walk all the time, not to mention in the garden where we're going and watering the plants and so on. So we're happy. We're relieved. The rattlesnake is gone. The next day, I'm in that same flower bed and I'm watering some flowers, some bush or something that hadn't gotten watered the day before. And I walk around to the other side and I look underneath where there are these three wild bushes that grow in this in this flower garden that we've left there because we love wild things, even snakes, and maybe especially snakes. And I look down and I see the long tail of the snake with the 12 rattles. I see oh, it is the same snake and it's back. Also, snakes are so intelligent. This snake was so smart. Can you imagine this? It was back within 24 hours. And who knows, maybe it came during the night. It probably was there the whole time I was doing things with the garden. So this time, Thomas took it much farther away, which we did not want to do because snake people know that uh, rattlesnakes, if they're taken too far away, they won't live because they're confused and disoriented. So we're praying for that snake. I know this may sound strange, but uh, we are praying for that snake because I I feel a deep connection to that snake. 
And I'm being very serious here. So back to the self, the self, the true nature, it knows that it is connected to all of life. It is connected with fires and floods and earthquakes. It is connected with people who are rioting and even the SWAT teams. It's connected with newborn babies and with hungry people all over the world, with happy people. It's connected with the planets of our solar system and their movements, the sun and the moon, with stars and with galaxies. Self-knowledge. All of our efforts towards self-knowledge, they, they need to be motiv- motivated by love. I will come back to this again. But if we are too hard on ourselves in our process of seeing into our own dynamics, what motivates us, the ways in which we, um, we would like to be different, the things that, that um, the obstacles, in fact, that, that hold us back from our own spiritual transformation, it's very important that we bring love to that process. So I want to talk a little bit about the obstacles to um, contemplation. And we pretty much all know what they are, but I'm going to just mention a few of them. You'll have your own list or your own ideas about what your obstacles are. I'm going to begin with just making a, a distinction between rumination and contemplation, because lots of times we confuse the two. We think that we're contemplating something when actually we're ruminating on it. We're obsessing about it. We're going over it and over it and over it, which can be useful up to a point, like recapitulating things that have happened in our lives. Maybe we need to recapitulate for a long time because we're digesting something. We're trying to, can, we're trying to digest it and make it a part of us and integrate it into our being. In the process of doing that, we can we cultivate wisdom, we court wisdom. But it's important to to know the difference. It's okay to ruminate. It's okay even to obsess. But let's know that that's what we're doing. This is that this makes all the difference. And at some point, we can just let it go because we have the power to let go. We don't tell ourselves that very often. We often forget that we have the power to let go. We can let go. We can liberate ourselves from emotions, emotional states, and mental states. We just have to decide that's what we want to do. And then we can begin to learn how. Of course, it's trial and error. We learn through our mistakes, and we learn by going, okay, here's my old friend, uh, here's my old friend addiction again. Here's my old friend cynicism. Cynicism is one of those things that that we may hold very near and dear to our hearts about ourselves. We love our cynicism. It's helped us out a lot over the years. It helped us get through difficult times. But at some point, it becomes an obstacle to our contemplation. It becomes an obstacle to the wonder and awe that we can experience in relationship with life. One of the things that, that we can learn in the contemplative process, as we engage contemplation more and more, contemplation can help us to understand and actually learn something about timing. Because in this process of knowing when to let go, and I'm saying we have the power to let go of, of, of um, ruminating or obsessing mental thoughts and, and emotional states, um, how do we know when it's actually time? If our rumination and our recapitulation is useful to us in the process of digestion, how do we know when it's time to let go? The Greeks have this, um, I, I like the Greeks a lot, you know, they're at their, their philosophy and culture and many, many things about ancient Greece, the, the, particularly the Greeks, not the Romans, that's a different story, but the Greeks, they have a lot to teach us, and they are at the foundations of Western culture, of course. So, but the Greeks have this concept. It's called kairos. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly. It's spelled K-A-I-R-O-S, and it is that exact moment when the whole cosmos is aligned 
It is the right moment for the thing that you are going to do. It is the right moment to let go. It is the right moment to make a certain decision, for example. Contemplation can help us a lot with this. My friend Robert Soboda, he's, he's often saying, um, don't make a decision until you absolutely have to. Wait, 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 wait. Contemplation can help us a lot with waiting. While we're waiting, we can be contemplating many things. So just one little comment I'd like to make going back to rumination is that um, rumination has this quality of obsession. It's charged. And we know that when we have a charge, and so maybe we're ruminating about this thing that a friend of ours did or someone we know did, when we're really hooked by something and we are going over it and over it and over it, we know that we are we are in shadow at that point. We're in something up. It really belongs to me. It's not about that other person over there. It's about me. You might just consider that, um, and you may perhaps perhaps you've already discovered the truth of it. But this is a very useful way to work with ourselves and and knowing ourselves and the alchemy that we can engage through our contemplation and the self-knowledge that comes from it. Okay, just a little bit more on obstacles. One of the the most common obstacles that we have to contemplation is the speed and drive of our lives today. And for many of us, if we're still working out in the world and we need to work and we maybe, you know, like Kina who's sitting here, my friend Kina, he is uh, 20... 29, already, in, almost done with your Saturn return. Ken is 29, and he has a career. He, he has a very big job, very um, uh, re, a lot of responsibility. And uh, so he's fully ensconced in the world and should be. So speed and drive, what, what can we do about that? That's the state of our world. It's what it is that we have to work with. And I know for myself, it's something... I used to love, I still really like it. I liked my own speed and my drivenness because I got a lot done. And I'm sure that you all have too. You get a lot done with speed and drive. But how often do we really complete something that we're doing? Are we leaving a trail behind us of those who, the, the, the broken and bleeding bodies of those who were working with us while we were speeding around and driving ourselves? Um, sometimes our speed and drive can be very out of relationship with others. And if we're out of relationship with others, then we are definitely out of relationship with ourselves. So the more we can bring this kind of contemplative presence and awareness to the things that we have to do, the list of things that we have to do, the more we are going to uh, be satisfied and happy in the long run, and the more others are going to be uh, drawn to us and able to work with us. The more creativity, the more um, cooperation. It's just it's just a much happier situation. I like to think of contemplation as an inner yoga, and I forgot to say that at the beginning of this talk. And I like to say it now, and I'm, I I want to say it a few times. It actually is an inner yoga because a yoga, of course, we, we all know this by now, a yoga is anything that links us to the divine. So contemplation is a kind of inner yoga. It's also a healing process. It's this process of getting to know ourselves in a loving way and in with radical self-honesty, with real self-honesty. This is a healing process, and it is a yoga so it's very important that we that we um, acknowledge and empower that process for ourselves. There's one other thing I want to mention in terms of obstacles, and that is that we we um, many times in our lives we'll find ourselves in an emotional cul-de-sac, like we feel that we are trapped. We don't know what to do. We can't. Maybe we do know what to do, but we. We think there's no way out, but there's always a way out of any situation that we find ourselves in. We just don't like our options because the option that we have, that, that, that life is giving us, 
requires or demands that we let go in some way. It demands that we sacrifice ourselves in some way or that we embrace some kind of a death, something in some way, a confrontation with the unknown. The more we cultivate the contemplative life, the more we're going to be able to meet these kinds of demands. So we want to engage a contemplative life because we want to see transformation and change. We want the world to be different. So we begin with ourselves and we work with ourselves. You know, if you all know about MC Yogi, he has this wonderful, he's a a rap artist and he, um, he has created, he's, He's written and has recorded all these fantastic uh, hip hop songs in which he tells the stories of the Indian Indian deities. And um, he has one one of his songs is about Gandhi, who's on my mind a lot these days. Nonviolent revolution. And he has this uh, this phrase. Of course, you'd be very familiar with it that he incorporates into that song for Gandhi. He says, "Be the change that you want to see." So back to this, uh, the need to approach this entire process. We are not talking about a strong-armed effort to change. We're talking about nonviolent revolution. We're talking about revolution that is based on love. The more we become aware, the more we can see clearly, the more we can accept things as they are, and some space is created when we do this. And in that space, some change becomes possible in ourselves. I'd like to read a quote to you from my teacher, Lee. This is from a little book that was published in the very early 90s. It's the title of the book is Derisive Laughter uh, from a Bad Poet. And here's the quote. The process is feminine and the keys to the lock which imprisons reality or truth are in a feminine approach. We must go at this knot of confusion called the mind or sleep or unconsciousness, illusion, or maya with a very gentle, humorous, patient, accepting relationship to it. We can practice vigorously, but with bright and flexible vigor, not rigid, righteous vigor. We must give ourselves time to relax into this enlightenment, whatever it is, rather than trying to force it to take us over, permeate our fears and illusions, which of course it cannot do, beyond the obvious, which is actually to realize that which we seek. If we approach this work as women, we may just discover something quite unexpected, surprising, and delightful. So I spent years trying to change myself, beating on myself, blaming myself, shaming myself, feeling guilty. Maybe some of you have, have uh, tried change from in, in that way as well. We despair, we're depressed, which is okay too. I'm coming to despair and depression, the Ds. But none of those methods work. And I, I love that Lee, I love this quote from Lee. I hadn't read it in years, really years, and I found it a couple of days ago. This, um, the process is feminine, and the keys to the lock which imprisons reality or truth are in a feminine approach. So he is not talking about a woman or women per se. He is talking about the feminine aspect of the human being. It's very important to, to understand that, or we miss the point altogether. This is for all of us. So we say to ourselves, after years and years, or maybe just a short time of trying to change ourselves through the um, hardcore effort uh, program of self-improvement, we say, I can't be different. I've just tried. I'm a hopeless case. Uh, I give up. And if we go, if we really go into that place, we find out that there's just really an entrenched no in there. And a no is okay. Sometimes we usually, in fact, have to get through no to get to yes when it comes to our own transformation. So I want to suggest and invite you 
you can, if you remember this after this talk, this could be a takeaway point, could be something else too, but to just consider that you could just stay with that, all of those feelings about, I'm never going to change, this isn't going to change, I don't even want to change, maybe. Whatever the knot, the tangled knot of that is for you, you just stay with it up against that wall of resistance until you are able or willing to just let yourself imagine, just imagine how you could change, how you could be different. Who would you be if you were different? What would you be doing if you were different? Where would you be? Just let yourself imagine it. Just freely imagine. No uh, no judgment, no censoring, no holding back. This is just your contemplation. This is your visualization. Full color. Go for it. Use your inner sight and see what happens. Just see what happens. Imagination is one of the things that gets unleashed in a contemplative life. And in my experience, imagination is the fountainhead of creativity. I watched this movie not too long ago. It's a movie about Shakespeare, and they've, uh, the, the um, historians have, have found out a lot more about the, the actual man, Shakespeare, William Shakespeare. And this movie, it's titled All is True is about his life and his family and what he was going through right after the Globe Theater where all of his plays were performed for years in London. It burned down. It was completely burned down. And when that happened, he went home to, I think, Devon, Devonshire or something like that, maybe. Uh, so in, in the movie, Shakespeare, he's been through this huge loss and he has come home to his family, who he's been, he's been neglecting his family for some decades while he's been writing all these incredible plays and sonnets and poetry and, and everything. And, and he decides he's going to make a garden. And he's digging out in his garden one day, and some young aspiring writer comes walking up, and he says, oh, you're Shakespeare, aren't you? And Shakespeare says, yes, I am. And, and the young aspiring writer says, how did you write all of that? What, what, what did you do? How, how did that happen? And, and Shakespeare says, well, I just wrote it. And the young man says, but you, you never went to Italy. You were never in Verona, and you were never in, in uh, Scots, Scotland. You were never, how did you write about all these places? And Shakespeare looks at him, and he says, well, imagination, of course. So if you've ever, you know, watched the movie Zeffirelli's version of, of Romeo and Juliet, you know, you know that Shakespeare, or you've read the play, or you've seen the play enacted, it's incredible, uh, you know that Shakespeare takes you to Verona, Italy, in that play, full on. He takes you to Scotland and Macbeth. He takes you wherever he wants to because he's using his imagination. So in our contemplation, we're not looking for answers. We're looking for insight. We're looking for intuition. We're looking for revelation. We're looking for the fountainhead of creativity. Some say, some wise people say that imagination is located in the heart. I think this, there's something to that. I don't think it's something that happens. It's not the mind that's doing imagination. It's something much deeper in us. Something that has uh, connections to grace. The bigger our inner space that we create through our contemplation and, of course, through meditation. Meditation, again, here's where they start weaving together, as they have many times during this talk. Um, the bigger the inner space, the more our creative imagination is going to come flooding into us and move us in different directions. So one of the most basic purposes of contemplation and meditation is to create spaciousness within us. There are lots of reasons besides the ones I've been talking about to have more space inside. Space allows for and supports us to rest to relax, 
It's so desperately needed. And our our relaxation and our rest can lead to rejuvenation, to recreating ourselves. It can lead to creative reverie, effortless flow. How many of you have ever tapped effortless flow? Just raise your hand. Just for fun. Thank you. And I know probably a lot of you who didn't raise your hands do know do know what that is. Effortless flow. It's pretty awesome. And as soon as you taste that elixir, that nectar, you want to go back there to effortless flow. It can also lead to inner peace. And this is a pearl of a precious, a pearl of great price. So now we're talking about the art of contemplation, the art of contemplation. So I, I want to go back to you know what we, we perceive or we think may be an obstacle to our contemplation. And it has to do with what I call the D's. D is in dog. D is in depression, despair, disease, dislocation, disillusion, those D moments, then sometimes those moments can last for a very long time. Do you all know what I'm talking about? Yeah, so the D's, the D experiences. It's not funny that all those words start with the, the letter D. It's very interesting. I really like the work of um, Parker Palmer. If you haven't read his work, I want to, um, I want to uh, just tell you that you can find some fantastic a fantastic essay that he wrote on contemplation. It's in his book titled The Active Life, pages 25 through 29. And he speaks to this, how important these states, depression, despair, disillusion, the human experiences that dissolve and deconstruct us when the foundations of our lives are swept away in a moment. These kinds of experiences have profound, profound capacity for transformation because they force us to go within. They force us to be contemplative. They are contemplative moments. If we can can empower those moments and empower that process in ourselves, have respect and honor for it, to know that it's a healing process, there's a lot that's possible for us through our depression, our despair, our disillusionment. Disillusionment. A lot of us are disillusioned right now. Some of us are despairing. Things don't look so good at the moment. All of this kind of contemplation, you know, when, when, we, have, when, we, when we have the foundations of our lives swept away, it often forces us to our knees. It forces us to pray, which, of course, is what the art of contemplation really is about. Whether we want to call it prayer or we want to call it something else, doesn't matter what we call it. I like the word prayer. You might prefer to call it something else, meditation, contemplation, being present to life, compassion. For me, one of the most powerful aids to my contemplation or one of the most powerful dimensions of contemplation is nature. I love nature. I've always loved it. I've been deeply connected to nature all my life. It's an active way to serve the world when we allow our contemplation to naturally evolve into prayer and we can bring nature into play because then we are in the feminine. Mother nature, she's called, for a reason. So it's nature's, um, nature's impersonal beauty, nature's impersonal perfection, and all of the lessons that nature can teach us about continuity, about death and renewal, about beauty. I take refuge in nature. I recommend, if you don't already, that you consider doing that. Trees can teach you a lot about contemplation because that's what they do. They just contemplate. So here's another quote from my teacher, Leigh Lozowick. I love this one. As we become more mature in our practice, it becomes tacitly obvious that all things have soul. And the more that becomes obvious, the more spontaneous and natural is our honoring and respect for all things, which is in itself entering into political and social community 
beyond our little spiritual enclave. So as we enter into the art of contemplation and we allow our art of contemplation to naturally evolve into prayer, rapture, reverie, the creative process, the more we become conscious in relationship to the sacred, the sacred world, the more we have a space inside for wonder and awe to come to arise in us just spontaneously and naturally, unexpected. What a wonderful surprise. Gratitude. All of these graceful and deep and profound feelings that are extremely healing. And they're healing not only to us, they're healing to the world. Anybody have a question? Thierry. Thierry's in France. Hi. Yeah, it, it's about it's about those Ds. Yeah. And um, I see that... Uh, Especially in times when I'm, I have a back condition. Sometimes I'm forced to stop and do nothing, and I can see the ar- arising of those ease in those spaces where I cannot do anything. So usually in those spaces, I see my tendency is wanting to go back to the gratefulness, to the joy, other spaces that I know as well, and. Um, it, it feels like there is some some value in staying in those D spaces, not doing uh, frenetically whatever I'm doing, as you were saying, being caught in the doing a lot of things mode. So I wonder if you can address that that feeling of um, that uh, how the, that working with staying in these difficult zones in order to touch something important without indulging in the luxury suffering. Mm -hmm. But I see the tendency to want to try to, in order not to stay with that. A couple of things come up for me. Um, This last winter, I was working with a a lot of chronic pain and and many things came up. Uh, It's somewhat better now. And... um, I had another dance with with those Ds. I had my own little dance with those Ds going on. And one of the ways that, that I personally practice in relationship to that is to name it, to say what it is for myself. And if it's physical pain, specifically, I say, this is real. If it's something like fear that's coming up, which comes up around... Um, about around pain also is it always going to be this way am i ever going to get am i ever going to get past this can i heal myself and so on um if it's fear then i say this is fear and i name it to myself i stay with it as much as i can and i think it's very important to stay with it and at the same time when we've had enough we've had enough and I, I think that that's the key. Like we can be depressed and, and despairing for a long time and it can be useful to us if we can stay present. Just stay present. Just be aware of it. I am in pain. I am in terror. I am in a deep state of anxiety. This is real. I think it's everybody has this experience at some point. I was working very specifically uh, for a while with being able to make the distinction between my consciousness and my body, that the body was suffering. The body was suffering, not in a way that separated me from it, because I'm not interested in being separated from my body. What I've understood from Lee is that the body is the vessel of transformation, We want to stay in it as long as we can because we can continue to work for transformation. It's it's a very deep, deep subject, working with pain, despair, depression. And we can say different things about it. And ultimately, we have to walk that road alone and find out for ourselves. And to take some breaks where you can. Watch a movie. Laugh. Laughter is a great thing. Laughter is a great medicine. Even when we're depressed, we can find a way to laugh. 
I mean, it's like grief, you know. Grief has its way with us. It just has its way with us. Why is it that way? I don't know why. That's a why question. You can't answer it. You can answer how, when, where, what, who, but not why. Grief has its way with us, and we will not be the same on the other side of it. And in fact, it never goes away. I mean, once we have stepped into the it stepped into the uh, alchemical bath of grief, our efforts to remain the same are swept away. Pain is like that, too. It changes us. So, you know, it's a Cohen. Lee said, Lee was talking about um, the alchemical gold of true suffering, of real suffering. So it's a, it's, it's a, um, it's a Cohen for us. Say it another way, there is the, I have the thought, there is the thought coming in that I'm doing something wrong when the D comes in. Mm -hmm. I should be always in that zone of great gratitude and joy. So I think that's the trap. Mm -hmm. Yeah, should, 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 should. But you know, what's, what, uh, what really is coming up for me, I have to be, be honest about this, that, um, at some point, it's thy will be done. And if what I am being given is pain in some kind of way, then that's what I have to work with. There's a surrender that's required of us. If we're really going to um, be devoted to the sacred, be devoted to the spiritual path, to spiritual transformation for the benefit of all, we take the good with the bad, we take the bitter with the sweet. If we're going to get the sweet, we're going to get the bitter. It's just the way it is in the realm of duality. If we're going to have joy, we're going to have sorrow. Otherwise, we have equal taste, samarasa, which is great. And we can go for that too. But it's all in the hands of grace. It's all in God's hands. You know, gratitude. I mean, I can cultivate gratitude, but really when it when it uprises, it upwells up in me. And, and it's just this, this spontaneous flood that I did an effort because I'm interested in this effortless flow business, <laughs> flowing, going with the flow, which has a lot to do with surrender. When gratitude comes up in me, it's a gift of grace. It's not because I made it happen. So many times Lee says in his poetry to Yogi Ram Srat Kumar, he says, um, a wash in, in the joy of your presence by your will or not by your will. This is radical surrender. And call it by whatever name we want to. The path is taking us in this direction. It's the direction of unity, of being, of being, having an awakened awareness of that which has created us. This is where the power of prayer is taking us. We could call it the heart of God. You know, we are the school that that I've been a part of, the path I've been on now for some decades. Um, it's a theistic path. I want to read um, one last quote to you from, from Lee. But first, I'm going to read just a little bit to you from Parker Palmer. This is the, the man who's writing on contemplation and the D's. He says, Solitude is a painful condition at first as are disillusionment and dislocation and the other Ds. But unlike those, solitude is something that sometimes grows on people. There's a reason for this. Disillusionment and dislocation are temporary conditions, passages we make in order to move beyond illusion and live in truth. But involuntary solitude is the permanent truth of our lives. We are born in solitude. We die in solitude. And we have opportunities to learn to live creatively with that fact in the years between birth and death. The fruit of disillusionment and dislocation and all the other Ds is the capacity to enter into and enjoy our solitude, compelled by the painful grace of a life process that is bent on helping us to get real. There's a Sanskrit word, bhavana, which um, refers to this 
state of contemplative prayer in which we focus on an object of our devotion, the cherished object of our devotion, Ishta Devata, um, whatever that might be. If, if you're not particularly theistic, you can say truth, love, beauty, unity, non-dual realization. If you are, if you are uh, disposed toward the theistic, then you can say whatever your object of devotion is. That which lives at the center of the heart. I love this phrase from Sri Anurvan. He was a bowl, a, a, a bowl who, a rare bowl who wrote and, and published books. And his books are have been very important to me. He says that the goal of his life is to live simply and die luminously. So the more we're willing to embrace and work with whatever life gives us, to have some humility, you know, that's one of the things that we get from the D's is we get some humility, like grief. We become very humble when we're faced with the power of grief. I wanted to thank you for the distinction between uh, contemplation and rumination. It's sort of something that's come up recently. I take morning walks. Uh, and so the idea of contemplation sort of, to me, seems to have less weight than the rumination. The rumination sort of has um, emotional and, and uh, uh, mental weight. And it's, you, you see that it's, just, it's not going anywhere creative or constructive. Whereas very often in the contemplation, I can see that there's light in it as opposed to, you know, just that, that idea of, of being stuck. And if what you say is really true. Um, contemplation has a buoyance to it. And it, that's because it has space. Space is a wonderful thing. And just back to the, the Ds, just one last thing about the Ds is that, you know, in the Rig Veda, it, the Rig Veda begins with, instructing us to contemplate the nature of the sky, to understand the true nature of our own being, our own uh, mind, but like big mind, not the little one. And um, this is something we can always do, is we can look at the sky. We can relate with the sun and the moon. We can remember to just look at the sun, look at the moon, look at the sky. So I'm going to close with this quote from Lee. How desperately the human race and its continued existence needs real devotees. I realize it is more than a lot to ask of you this sacred way. I ask nonetheless. I am anxious. I am very anxious. I have seen the coming times. It is not only that you need God, it is that you need one another. Need, not even as food or shelter, but as deeply, more deeply than the very air we breathe. You must consider loving God in an organic, total way, or life has no meaning. This I know, heart, flesh, blood and soul, chemically and cellularly. Existence is meaningless if you don't reach the heart of God. Thank you for your presence tonight.